All right, so uh, let me just uh, review what we did. Um, so I posted these um, project guidelines, which uh, were slightly modified from similar last last year's class, and I, I think Gregor actually went through a lot of these issues in the last week's class when I wasn't able to be here. And it will all be built around the GitHub repository. And um, this project is half the total grade. I will, whatever it claims to be marked out of, which is 100, it will be rescaled to be half the grade. Um, and there are various examples, 100 or so examples from the past. And uh, they're all situated, situated in different parts of that GitHub. And uh, we were all trying to make a software project and a report. And the report is meant to describe some area of AI first engineering that's um, where, which is intriguing and that AI will make some big impact. And there will be a software project that illustrates that in some fashion. It doesn't have to be the breakthrough um, software that predicts the stock market accurately for the next 10 years, it, but it should illustrate the types of methods that could be used. And you do not have to use the, a full size data sample. You can just use a, a um, illustrative example. So we we'll want to have a, a sort of sound project report on the area covering the state of the art and an illustrative software project. And everything will be done with open source technology. And there are some details here about plagiarism is simple. You just cite everything you used, everything you use. And you we're gonna use um, Markdown because then that makes it much easier to host from GitHub. GitHub is actually one of the easier ways of making your own websites. And uh, Gregor has made a nice description of um, how to use Markdown, but there are also several on the web. Then we had these two assignments. One assignment Gregor set in the last class, basically set you up to use GitHub. Then I just added, um, uh, the assignment I just um, posted, which is to do the final project, where we, I, we, I and Gregor will grade the, what you present in GitHub. And if fast Canvas, you can either send us email or just post something in Canvas saying that you've submitted it and you have to submit by the end of the day, May 7th of um, this year. All right, so that's the um, overall, um, Description. Are there any um, questions about that? All right, so we're all set up. So now we will uh, go to the uh, the few minute, five to, to 10 minute presentations by each of the students and um, uh, but I'll start at the top top left of my screen, which is an issue. An issue. How can you give your presentation? Absolutely. Go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, so in my project, I'm looking at deep learning and drug discovery. So drug discovery is simply the process through which new medicines are discovered. My reviews on this subject indicate that deep learning is finding uses in at least two areas. The first being in developing novel chemical structures and this is by learning latent 
variables within chemical structures that are known to be effective against maladies. And then using that information to predict other new chemical structures that are likely to possess the same quality. So generative adversarial networks and recurrent neural networks are being used for this or being considered for use for this. For my particular project though, I'm looking at predicting biological responses, to the properties of chemicals. So it's the, the second. I'm working with a data set that was originally made available on Kaggle by Merck Pharmaceuticals through the Merck Molecular Activity Challenge in 2012. And it consists of 15 biological activity data sets in CSV format. The data is from the output of high throughput screening assays, which are processes in which automated equipment is used to conduct tens of thousands of scientific experiments on molecular compounds in parallel. So the training set and test set were determined by when the assays were conducted. The training set assays were conducted first and then the test set assays. The training set files have a column for molecular ID. Uh, it's all coded. And then a column that shows a measure for activity, biological activity. And then uh, thousands of columns that indicate molecular substructures, coded molecular substructures. And the data in those columns represents the frequency at which those particular substructures appear in a particular molecule. So the test files are similar, but they do not have the activity column. And the objective of the challenge is to predict the activity measure for the test set. Success on the competition was determined by how close the prediction measure was to the actual values obtained or read for the activities. And the file for the actual values was not made available through Kaggle. So in terms of AI use, the winning entry used an ensemble that included a fully connected neural network at its core. The fully connected neural network basically did a classification or regression of, of findings across the assays. The literature I've been looking at and resources suggest that adding a convolutional neural network will actually help the performance of of the model by concentrating learning on substructures that are of interest. Since not all the substru not all the substructures have an associated biological e activity or effect. So using the convolutional neural network uh, should, should focus the learning on, on substructures of interest and reduce the number of parameters in the overall network. I provided a link to where you can find more on my GitHub project there. And in terms of progress, I'm wo currently working on a fully connected network solution, which I plan to have complete by April 9th. And I'll improve on that model by adding a convolutional network in front of that. And I have said that for April 23rd as the date. An issue that I'm likely to uh, that I'm actually facing right now is that since the, the file that actually shows what the, what, what the actual readings were was not shared on Kaggle, uh, that's an aspect that I'll need to actually uh, get around to, to get the actual readings so that, so that I can do a, a, an analysis of how well my predictions correlate what the actual findings were on the uh, so is that data available i i as of now i have not yet found it 
That's interesting. I would have thought somebody would have, it seemed to be more useful if they'd actually published it and you can, yeah. then you can actually see if you've done better. Otherwise, there's no way of people knowing if they've done better. Right, absolutely. I, I assume they figured people might reverse engineer things if they had access to the, the file, but now that the challenge is actually over, I think. When was the challenge over? Oh, it was issued in 2012. Um, I, I, I don't know exactly when they ended the challenge, but given that there was a winning entry, it, it, it should be over by now. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, well, that's certainly a pretty, that, I, that seems to be pretty solid. Um, you may need a plan B or something if you can't find the, well, you could even um, take the training set and break it out and make a fake test set by removing some of the training set. Yeah, there you are. That's, that's a great idea. Yeah, I think that, that would be, um, how much, how many, um, how many rows are there of those? How many compounds? I, I have not established how many they are, but they are quite a lot. So as long as they're enough, I think you can just make your own, your own, you can just take that training set and divide it into a real training set and a, and a testing set. Because I don't see any, any hope otherwise, unless you can find somewhere on the web. It's quite likely it's on the web somewhere. I mean, if it's all over, somebody's bound to have put it somewhere. And they do have, as part of this test, which is from eight years ago, <clears throat> published something that's called test set. So the hope would be that on the website, that would be uh, that test that you could be using. Anyway, it looks pretty good. I think either, mm -hmm. uh, so we have, a, we have a plan B, so you're okay. The convolutional network, what is it convolving? What, what is the, I mean, normally there you have images and pixels and things. So what, what are the, you're just somehow convolving those, those different rows, different columns rather? So, so uh, yes, so the, most of those rows actually have zeros on them. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. There weren't many non-zeros yeah. on that sample you showed. Yeah, and and so uh, according to one paper, I was looking at only five percent of of the overall structure actually has the interesting data. Yes. So and so by using the convolutional network, we should be able to reduce the number of connections rather than using a fully connected network. Interesting. Okay. The determination. All right, if we move along, move along, then Paula's next. She's, uh, she's at least on my screen in the top right. All righty. Um, let me get my screen share going. Oh, wrong thing. Sorry. Um, present, that's what I want to do. OK. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, so my project uh, is identifying uh, agricultural weeds with a convolutional neural network. Um, so the problem, so we have a uh, growing global population and we're going to need more food to feed everybody. So uh, we were able to um, keep up with the population for uh, food growth with um, you know, developments in agriculture, like uh, chemical fertilizers and pesticides, but they can uh, have a harmful impact on the environment if you've ever, you know, driven, you know, through, uh, you know, the Midwest and seen some of the, like, you know, the waterways that are, have all the green algae in it. Um, and it can, being more efficient with the use of these, um, of, of these tools can uh, improve with the efficiency of uh, growing the food uh, in addition to helping the environment. So there's a, a lot of uh, interesting areas in agriculture for the use of AI. Um, 
and the one that I'm working with is identifying weeds. So the um, Aarhus, Aarhus um, University of Plant Seedling data set has images of uh, 960 unique uh, plants of, of 12 species uh, shown here. Those are some sample pictures. So um, you can use a convolutional neural network to um, uh, train to categorize these seedlings. And then um, the nice thing about having a data set this nice is that you have a data set that that's, that's um, that nice. The small problem is that everybody else recognizes that too. So there's a lot of work done on it already. Um, so what I, a lot of them are um, use TensorFlow. So I'm going to implement it on PyTorch just so I, you know, I'm not directly copying anything. Um, and there's a lot of existing work to look at for it for inspiration. So to make it a, um, a little a little different than just you know training the network on this data set is that um, I'd like to take a subset of the images from that data set and make a little agricultural you know or like a little uh, crop row because we don't want we don't want weeds that look like this in our crops and to intentionally place them in a you know kind of clumped way and once the um, data set is, or the um, AI is set up to categorize and recognize the plants, I'd like to visualize it in the form of a row, which would be a little more helpful to our hypothetical farmer who can look at that. And I'd like to be able to see if they can say, oh, okay, at this section of the row, we should apply this type of um, you know, herbicide. Um, and just to see if you can extrapolate the um, correct identification to something that might be um, more, or you know, practical, and uh, implying a, a next step. And these are uh, some of the sources I've been looking at. So if we look at that last picture. Have people actually built neural nets to interpret such pictures? The uh, that the sure. pictures were simple. It's like the pictures of, say, cars or polar bears. When you have uh, which have polar bears driving cars and things like that, <laughs> then you need these region finding components and things. I I haven't looked specifically. So a lot of what I found on this was you'd have a like a machine that goes through the through the rows when the when the crops are still you know little and it would take pictures directly from above so they would look more like this this picture here i was just looking for an example of you know crop rows with weeds in them <laughs> and like with herbicide you you generally want to get that on there as soon as possible and not let it get to that point yeah i have uh, two comments um um, okay. When you write up your review on these technologies, you may want to take also a look at satellite images and efforts that oh. um, classify uh, tree uh, tree growth and yeah. actually different trees. This may be okay. uh, another very good similar example. Um, the uh, second thing is when you look at this example that you have here. You can, there are programs out there that allow you to highlight certain areas and um, uh, uh, go to the uh, picture number four. Slide number four. Okay. And, and you were, for example, to identify that heart shaped leaf and identify the plant for that. Uh, okay. You can, you can um, put a bounding box around this. And then um, you could be making a classification of this. Then naturally, you need to be doing this hundreds of times yourself. So you can really technically develop the test set yourself you so desire and uh, make it from the side. However, this is a lot of effort. Um, uh, uh, Jeffrey's wife group has actually done this with race cars before. 
but they used uh, the same te technology and you can really do this with whatever object or whatever other thing you have. You can put in ants and, and rabbits and whatnot other things in there. In, in yeah. The picture. So, but, uh, but uh, that, that you may want to explore. And okay. um, I tried to find out the name of the program that I have used before in this particular thing. I have done this actually with, uh, uh, with a disk that I launched in, in, in water. It's called Setchite Disk. And we measured the depth of how deep the Setchite Disk can actually go in there. And we used the same technology that you would be using here. Oh, that's really neat. So this is sometimes some, there's this uh, so-called transfer learning where you basically take something, say, um, trained with ImageNet, and then you do a very small amount of retraining. So in your, in your convolutional networks, are you going to start from scratch with these images or, or take one of these famous ones like ResNet or something, which has been trained on the, and trained on other images? Mm -hmm. oh, Either okay. I think is reasonable for this purpose of this, Class, I think either either a ab initio um, or a transfer learning approach is valid. I think they're equally sound because both of them illustrate the issue. Okay. So I think your problem, well, any problem I see with your project, it is so ambitious that this, in that you're going to solve the world, you're going to feed the world. So it's not too clear that you'll be able to. Uh, totally solve this uh, feeding of the world problem and well, reliably identify a, a billion weeds on a, on a, on a, on a field. Or I don't know how many weeds a field has. Uh, well, there's, looks like we've got three regular crops and the rest are weeds, so nine. Uh, you can also participate in an Indiana uh, competition where you oh. identify um, uh, tree strangling weeds. Yeah. And uh, you can win a flower. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. All right, all right. Thank you. Good. It looks wonderful. All right. How about Baikun Park? Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Okay. Can you, share, can you see my screen? Yes. Hey, good afternoon. My name is Begum Park, and today uh, let me introduce my project proposal. Uh, this presentation includes what the problem is, what kind of data set and algorithms can be used, and what uh, what this project will go. So, well, what is the problem? Uh, South Korea relies on imports for about 90-30% uh, of its energy resources as of the first half of half of uh, 2020. So especially uh, Korea Gas Corporation imports LNG, which stands for liquefied natural gas, to supply it to various places. Uh, therefore, uh, it needs a storage tank because uh, ensuring a stable gas supply. So the Wholesale charges of LNG include uh, LNG storage tanks operation and maintenance cost. Therefore, the forecasting energy demand supply, supply can be expected uh, to have economic effects uh, either directly and indirectly. Okay. So uh, what kind of data set can be used? Uh, uh, when uh, it is low season temperature, the demand for gas increases. Uh, also, when the price, price of fuels 
uh, such as oil and coal increases, uh, the demand for alternative energy uh, like gas uh, increases. So the uh, natural gas supply data set can be used for training. And uh, as I mentioned previous page, uh, the climate data set and the price data set uh, of oil and coal can be used. The, uh, in this project, uh, the basic programming language will be Python and a platform will be Google Colab. Uh, and to deal with the various type of data set, uh, Pandas can be used for data pre-processing. And finally, for forecasting the gas supply and demand, TensorFlow and Keras can be used. Uh, First week, uh, we are located to find more data set algorithms and related uh, work. And the following week will be used to perform data pre-processing. Then the network model will be designed and final week will be the time to forecast and complete project. Thank you. So what type of work has been done here already? Um, I assume these are time series, is that right, your data? So you'll be using some sort yes. of a current network to, to predict um, from, from the um, price and uh, maybe um, amount of and, and demand and things to predict future demand. That sounds yeah. like a, a, a pretty solid um, LSTM type uh, network. Yes, I, I, I'm not sure, but uh, the deep neural network or recurrent neural network uh, maybe will be used this project. Well, why don't I think you should um, you you can send me an email and things and I can help you, but just um, um, identify what the data is. You know, this is this data is available once a month or once a day, uh, or what ha, for each of these types of data because it's actually quite hard to mix data on multiple timescales. It's much easier if they're all on the same timescale. Okay. The usual. Um, Recurrent, the simplest recurrent networks all operate when data are the same. It doesn't matter what the time scale is, but they have to be at the same time scale. Of course, you can, um, you can manipulate the data. If you have one data, which is weekly, and another data, which is monthly, you can interpolate. You can do it. We either convert the weekly data to monthly, or you can do some sort of linear some sort of interpolation to make the monthly data weekly and things like that. So I, I, I suggest you estimate the effort required there. Okay. And so could you, got, could you go back to your data slide? So I think your, um, um, what, what, what I was lacking when I reviewed this uh, project was a more clear specification where you have the data set from. So you take the data set from the NGA supply data set and yes. you identify already nine regions, but you're not specifying to us where, where the data is hosted and where you get this data from. Ah, uh, uh, yes. The, the, this is the reason why I, for example, had a difficult time um, understanding what you would like to do. And this is also the reason why Jeffrey asked these questions. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the other thing is, is because you have not provided the data set, I naturally did a, a quick uh, research on, you know, what is being offered. And especially on the NGN, uh, NG uh, supply data set, a lot of research has actually already been done. Mm -hmm. um, that is also missing in your analysis. Uh, so so it, it would be great if you were to um, um, once more uh, identify what has actually been done with these regions. This also, when you look in, into the available um, 
uh, 10 publications that you just find via, via Google search on this. They are all doing neural network, but some of them doing um, uh, uh, some more classical algorithms uh, mm. on, on this stuff. You need to be identifying really what you would like to do. Mm. I urge you to, uh, to do this rather quickly. And I would actually condense your time framework uh, a bit because um, you may, may have, based on the data set that you're selecting, you may have to change things or you may have lear to learn additional things in order to come up with this, in order to identify, you know, are you doing an LSTM algorithm? Or are you doing something else based on, on, on other, other types of analysis these, these guys are doing, right? I think an LSTM is likely to be the simplest model. Yes, at least I, I, if you tell me the climate is available monthly, you should try to get all the data manipulated to be monthly data. Yeah, and naturally you know that there are from other countries um, the analysis of the monthly temperature uh, towards energy supply, there are already finished algorithms there and uh, um, they are just applied to different countries. You need to be making sure that if you do one of those models, please uh, uh, avoid that we find all of a sudden, hey, you know, this is being done here in a different country, but the algorithm. But I don't think it matters for this class if somebody's done this in a different country. As long as, as long it's in as, the references. As long as what your effort is, you know, your own effort. Yeah. And because uh, again, we're not trying to actually solve Korea's problem. We're trying to illustrate methods which could be used to solve that problem. So I, I would actually try to follow Gregor's hints that there may be some uh, published work which suggests which way you can go to quickly get an answer. Because I think your main problem is you have a little over a month to go. And so we don't want to, uh, I would urgently discover what time interval and what what total time interval and what, and how often the data is made available for each of these types of data sets. But it's an interesting problem, so, and it illustrates a pretty important class of problem. All right, uh, that sounds good. Thank you, thank you very much, Bakun. How about Jayu? Uh, hello. Hello, can you tell us what you're doing? Yeah, so my project here is the protein family type prediction. Uh, so the so I'm uh, using the data set of uh, the proteins uh, uh, amino acid sequence. So the the majority of the data uh, record are proteins. So uh, proteins are usually centered around one or few chop, which is defined by their family type. Uh, for example, some proteins uh, is fr uh, are from a hydrolysis group, which focus on catalyzing the hydrolysis. Uh, another protein may come from the transport uh, transport family, so which allows other molecules come in and outside the cell. So the task here is uh, given the given the DNA sequence or the amino acid sequence and some metadata, metadata we build some model to predict the family type of the pro protein. So the, the, the protein structure prediction problem in, in general is very, is very complex. Uh, that, that requires, uh, given the sequence of the DNA or RNA, we predict the uh, three-dimensional structure of the protein. So that is, uh, the, the currently the best result maybe is uh, alpha fold two and uh, they they provide some of uh, some of the their code and the data set which is very large so uh, it's it's not realistic uh, to 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 do in sev several weeks so uh, this is the family type prediction is relatively a simpler problem we we do not predict the 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 whole structure we just predict the function and the family type of the uh, pro protein. So the data set uh, is come from a website called RCSB and protein, uh, protein database uh, data bank. And the, the 
the the protein data bank is a, a re repository of atomic uh, co co coordinates and other information describing uh, proteins and other important biological macromolecules. So the struct the structural biolog biologists um, will determine the location of of each atom and uh, and uh, deposit this information uh, in this in this website. And the, this 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 data uh, data set is also available on Kaggle. So this is a Kaggle website. We can also download this website on Kaggle. And other people already provide some code for the for analyze and predict the uh, the, the 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 protein family. But uh, I look through their their approach. Mostly they are using the multi-nominal naive base and the SVM. So given that the data set, the, the input is a sequence, I guess uh, maybe we can implement the LSTM or other deep learning model uh, may have some good effect on this uh, data set. So that is uh, what I plan to do. That's really interesting. Do you, how do you cope with the fact that sequences are of different length? Uh, different uh, sequences with different lengths? Well, I mean, you have these string of characters, but I suspect in this data set, so the number of characters in the string is different for each protein. Yes, yes, they are different. So, uh, but so, I, uh, as far as I know, some RSTM model can uh, apply to different uh, lengths of sequence. Yeah, I'm sure they can, but it's, it's a little bit, I mean, uh, the only issue I have with this project, it could be quite, um, quite challenging, but you can probably uh, it's, uh, it's, yeah, because we already have other people's work, we can take a reference, but yeah. they are not using the RSTM. I'm not sure RSTM actually works, but I guess it should give some results. Yeah, it should work or even a transformer model might work. Hmm. Uh, yeah, there, there, there are at least uh, uh, some papers that are using LSTM for this. What is the actual, the net result is you feed in the, the inference problem is you feed in a protein and you feed out its, um, you feed Yeah, it's a, cl it's a classif classification. Some, some belongs to the hydrolysis, some is a tra transport. So uh, what do you do? You just take the Kegel data set or the, and then split off 20% or something for testing? Yes, that's what I plan, yes. So their data set is, is quite big. It's more than 100 megabytes. So it's a quite, quite big data set. Fancy this. It's amazing as CSV files, which are so crude are so um, per pervasively used. Um, good. Um, Yeah, I think, I, I mean, I find one interesting feed, I think I may have mentioned, and my impression is classic ge genomics, which is sort of study of DNA and things, has not used deep learning that much. And so I think applying deep learning to those older areas of bioinformatics could be pretty promising because the, the field doesn't seem to have, the, the classic bioinformatics field has not really adopted deep learning. Do, do you have a background in uh, in this area? No, no, I, I'm not. Uh, uh, it's it's purely deep learning uh, for, for me. I don't know. The yes, lots knowledge. of background in deep learning. So I think you shouldn't need background in this field to do this. Unless it totally fails and you need some biological insight to, to make it uh, to choose another method. But I think it's worth exploring. I think you could say this is uh, first lo looking at uh, classic bioinformatics sequences using deep learning. I think that's pretty pretty reasonable. In fact, okay. uh, what would AlphaFold take us as input? Would it take this type of input? Yes, they will. Uh, their input is a sequence of the uh, amino acid or all the DNA sequence. So, an output is a 3D structure of the protein. But they probably don't use LSTM, is that right? I think, don't they use a fully connected network or something? 
Well, that, their model is quite complex. I, I don't have time to... No, I, I, agree, I agree. In all the literature, people are so wowed by AlphaFold, but there's no actually very clear description of it. Um, all right, who we have now? How about Anna? Can you give your ne the presentation next? Did you say Anna? Yes, Anna, yes. Okay, you, you cut out for a bit. I'm, sure. I'm sorry, I'm too far from my speaker. I'll get nearer. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm doing chatbots in customer service. The uh, problem is that um, a lot of them, or a lot of companies are doing um, some sort of animation or uh, automation uh, for just customer service. And I saw that around 30% of like the top companies were. Um, now the problem is, however, that a lot of them aren't very um, robust. Uh, when I was, they take very specific questions. If you misspell something, uh, they mix, they miss context. Um, and what I found when actually uh, doing research on this is that a lot of the uh, quote unquote chatbots will like ask you a question and it'll effectively be a quiz. So uh, they've pre-asked um, they've asked a question and they've pre-assigned answers. And if one of your answers isn't specifically that, you're just out of luck or they will um, uh, direct you to like a, a real person customer service. Um, so I found this data set on uh, Kaggle and it's basically customer, ser customer support via um, Twitter. Uh, for various companies. And basically here, uh, I've listed what um, the data consists of and basically like the tweet ID and things like that. Um, probably what is most important will be the contents and the responses of that. Um, yeah, uh, the responses and if that tweet was a response as well. Uh, the pre-existing efforts, a lot of data sets from what I've seen on Kaggle already have um, like pre-existing uh, handling of the data. So I'll probably look at that for how to uh, work with my data as well. Uh, and there's a lot of um, sort of uh, create your own chatbots uh, articles online. Most of them, of what I found, use uh, RNNs and an encoder and decoder to find patterns in uh, sentences and then create a response via the encoder and decoder, I think. Uh, and then the links to what is already existing. Okay. This is, again, also pretty ambitious. Okay. So I think uh, my main advice would be to make certain you um, scope scope the scope what you do to fit the time so you get at least uh, something out of it. Mm -hmm. And if you need any help or choice, just just drop me an e drop me an email. Okay. But I think it's uh, we know this. I think we all know the frustration of dealing with some of these um, online systems. <laughs> and they drive you me crazy some of them they're so pedantic mm -hmm. okay do, do you have any comments gregor uh no just that my favorite project would be uh um taking my my voice stream and detecting all the earths that i'm saying when i, will, <laughs> I make a zoom recording and eliminate <laughs> them that would be my that's that's probably an easier problem than this. Yeah, that's <laughs> the reason why I'm saying this because quickly. you have to squeeze one one audio signal and just wrapping it out. This mm -hmm. one, and uh, you can you identify have to, uh, interpret it. So anyway, but uh, mm -hmm. I I believe you can scope. You should be careful that that I will be quite 
I will have no problem if you scope down this giant problem to something which is illustrative of what a much better chatbot could look like. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't I wasn't quite sure how ambitious because oh, one like part this? of me was like, oh, this isn't ambitious at all. And then I was like, no, oh, I consider like, this highly ambitious. <laughs> so all right, how about well, uh, well you've done well. Just uh, just don't just be realistic. Mm. All right, who do we have next? Riz Rizharp, is are you there? Yep. Uh, let me just share my screen. Um, so I'm doing stock level prediction and I, I was kind of thinking that more than one person would be doing this, but I, I guess it's just me. Um, so the problem, to be honest, there isn't really a problem. I just like or love stocks a lot and I like using technology to make things easier and like earn money. Um, even though there is a potential problem um, or like a thing that I think I can work on, which is using volume. So I've seen a lot of stock level prediction models that use the opening and the closing prices or like uh, the midday prices and stuff. Um, but none of the LS, none of the LSTMs or the modules have used volume. And I think volume is one of the things can that can that has pretty good potential because even currently if we listen to um people talking about the stock market they talk a lot about volume if the volume is high because it's it's pretty much about if people buy a stock more the price is going to go higher so like a volume the volume is a huge factor uh and i want to find a way to incorporate that into the model um so data set uh yahoo finance is my friend <laughs> you can pretty much get anything using this link i think this one is for uh apple um you get open high low close um uh, volume um so yeah it's it's it, it's pretty easy uh you can download data sets from um from like 1990s i guess uh using yahoo finance so uh it's pretty handy um yeah, so the so the algorithm that almost everyone is is using is LSTM because that's pretty obvious, right? Because it's supposed to be an RNN um, uh, network, but um, uh, like this 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 particular graph shows the stock level prediction using RNN uh, using LSTM, and like it did kind of fail pretty miserably. Um, and I'm trying to find a new way where it can like use volume so that it doesn't make errors like these, um, and it's more accurate. Um, and I found like multiple articles about how LSTM, or uh, there are better ways than LSTM, um, to do this. Um, so that's what I'm working on right now. Um, yeah, like I said, trying to use volume, um. And also trying to use what price to use, um, what exactly, like which price to use. Is it the opening price, the closing price, uh, the midday price? Um, so that's also one question that I'm trying to answer uh, at this point. So for my timeline, uh, I'm definitely looking to finalize or look into different models that I can use by the end of this week uh, by Sunday. Um, and if I can like incorporate volume in it, in any way, uh, and then in the next week, I'm I'm trying to at least since there are already a lot of existing models, I, I thought maybe I should try at least two different models um, or algorithms, and then um, once I finalize that in the next week, I can work on that particular model um, in the week after and try to make it more accurate. Um, so yeah, that's that's about it. So I mentioned to you that I, in my you know, comments on your homework, that transformers should work well in this, should probably outperform LSTM in this problem. Because um, oh, okay. we find that, it, that, that I have a, a friend who I work with on earthquakes, uh, somebody at UC Davis, uh -huh. and his earthquake mo prediction models 
have, saw, have actually been applied to the stock market because oh, wow. both the stock market and earthquakes are notable for giant events, which are dramatic. Namely, mm -hmm. there's lots of ripple around and maybe some gradual effects, but there are also some collective effects where I don't know that everything goes wrong together. And that's a, like a giant earthquake. So there's a lot of extreme events. Mm -hmm. and and the why transformers could possibly be useful is that with the, they can possibly recognize better the pa the patterns that um uh that the stocks form there is a, a type of stock analysis called technical analysis which i don't know much about but it basically looks at pictures of the stock price as a function of time and there's a picture called a head and shoulders or something. They have names for different uh, stock structure. And then these so-called technical experts predict the stock market based on these structures. Well, I'm yeah, sure a neural net can easily learn all, all those structures very simply. Mm. So it's bound to be able to do whatever the technical analysis do very well. Yeah, right. I was just wondering if there was some way I could also include volume in it because I know no, I think you, but all of these methods, whether it be LSTM or transformer, you can feed in any, you can both predict what you want and feed in what you want. Right. Like for the earthquakes, I feed in um, effectively daily data. Actually, I use fortnightly data, but I also feed in simultaneously data over the average over the last year. I feed in um, the magnitude of the earthquake mm -hmm. and the depth of the earthquake. And so I feed in lots of uh, different information. And there's also the location of the earthquake. I feed in which faults it occurs on. Gotcha. And the, as far as I know, in all these formulations, the number of input predictable quantities is is not a not an issue you can just change you can easily add more predictive properties and also more output properties you can predict anything you like at on the output as long as you have training data anything you have training data for you can both um, input and output yeah that makes sense well, i'm sure this is we know there's lots and lots and lots of work on this. In fact, I mean, I used to be a physicist. And I remember when I was at Caltech in, it must have been uh, the 80, late 80s, the lot, all the physicists were hired by Wall Street to become so-called quants. Hmm. Because at that stage, there was a lot the very, those are when the actually neural nets were first developed. Uh, although the methods they use them are probably not neural nets, but they were um, methods related to that. And uh, there was a huge, there's a huge number of very talented people. There's a, um, a famous place called the um, Santa Fe Institute, which is in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And it's, um, it is uh, devoted to the study of complex systems. And I think I mentioned a complex system is actually well, either earthquakes or stock market are complex systems. There are systems which have dynamics, then they, they evolve or move around and things like that. And, but they're not governed by famous equations like Schrodinger's equation or Newton's equation. And Santa Fe Institute is somehow a world leader and has been that for a long time in that area and one of the earliest startups from Santa Fe was in the stock market. It actually was a Santa Fe Institute itself came from the Salamis National Lab, which is a Department of Energy lab, the one that actually probably led the uh, nuclear weapon development during the war. That's where people like Feynman worked. Anyway, this is a very old, and what I'm saying is this is a very well established field. And I'm sure you, you, you may not be able to in this little time uh, make a revolution, but you can certainly get, get some good progress because clearly this data is, can naturally be a, a, is of a type that can easily be applied to um, LSDMs or transformers. 
Yeah, that's correct. Thanks. Because it's they're just cleaned. I pointed out to um, uh, back Bakun that you need to be careful about the time interval. While the stock, your volume and price information is all can all be done at the same at a given time. I mean, if you usually you get it every day, but of course you can get it at a. You can either accumulate it to be weekly, or you can. Uh, there is, of course, available much more accurate data. There's all these people who do. Um, well, there, there, there's a name for um, people who trade on the instant price of a stock in the you know millisecond range. I forget what it's called now. Um, but anyway, data you choose a time scale, and that, that, that all your different quantities are available at that time scale. But the yeah. methods, I suspect, are lot, possibly independent of the time scale. Mm -hmm. All right, we still have time for Jesus. Uh, would you, Jesus, would you like to talk? Uh, yeah, let me pull up my, or let me share my screen real quick. Can you see that? Yes. All right, so I am going to be using the What's going on? The Carla simulator. I'm not sure if you've heard of that, but it's used a lot of autonomous vehicle research, which it's basically uh, like a simu like a game, except that it has uh, actual data of different cars moving around. And also it gives you good sensor data for whatever sensor you choose to use. Like if you want to use like cameras or LIDAR, and it also works in different environments, like in rain or, or snow or something. So a lot of uh, a lot of uh, companies and researchers use it to try to understand or solve the problem of full self driving. Is it not? So this is just how uh, how Carla looks when you're running it if you're using a manual control. So the way that I've been trying to use a uh, carla so far it's a pretty heavy program to run by the way but it's really gpu intensive so i found this one resource that has an open source github, GitHub uh, that tries to run carla through a remote desktop using a turbo vnc and cloud fair uh, i haven't actually gotten carla to work there i'm not sure if it's because i'm using the wrong version of carla but I, I have the whole remote desktop to to uh google colab working and so you that, have VNC yeah. to work. huh you have vnc working yeah I, I have everything working except for carla on the vnc okay but basically the data set is just uh images that i'm generating through driving through traffic or normal, I guess, operation of a car. And, oh yeah, and I'm gonna be using the Tesla Model 3 just since, um, I don't know, I like the car. <laughs> Good. Uh, Okay, so this is the algorithm I plan to use because I've been doing research on it and I think it's a good algorithm. It's a, it's Q learning, but like instead of using a Q table, you replace it with a neural network. So it's deep Q learning. And uh, basically you use the normal state action pairs and you run them through a neural network and try to improve the decision-making process of the car to try to get it to navigate itself. And it also has access to the, the normal things that you have access to in a car, like the throttle and the steering angle. So it could adjust all of that while using the camera feed. So uh, I found this study on Kaggle that uses ResNet 34 and uh, what's, I think it's called transfer learning. Yeah, well, transfer learning is what I mentioned, just trained on an, another data set and applied to this data set. Yeah, I think it, they just had it to run, uh, I think just straight. I can't remember exactly off the top of my head, but 
Yeah. I think it's realistic to try to use a transfer learning because ResNet is a very well, well, well um, um, just uh, guided uh, convolutional network. Yeah. Um, let me see. Okay, so this is the timeline that I plan to implement. So right now I'm still on week one. I've been uh, I've been trying to set up Carla. I'm almost done with that. And setting up the data set or getting a data set from Carla. So week one and two should be fast. So really the rest of the time is just trying to implement either the deep Q learning algorithm and which takes a long time to run from what all the research that I've been doing and trying to tune the vehicle parameters along with that. So I could have a, I want in my report, I want to put a video of the car actually driving itself. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Yeah. So I want to get that done. And then the last week, I'm just planning for catch up, but I'm going to try to get it done as soon as possible. And these are my references. Well, that's yet another very ambitious project. Yeah. Um, I feel like I, I chose self-driving cars because uh, I've done a lot of work with like not just cars, but self-driving cars. My senior project is over cars. I've done a research thing over cars. So I, I get a lot into the dynamics. I've never gotten into the computer vision of it. So I guess it's it's okay. another aspect of the car I like to get into. So uh, he says, uh, the knowledge that you have on Carla comes from another class, is that correct? Uh, no, it actually comes from uh, Coursera and Udacity because over the summer, IU gave us full access to Coursera for free. So I just took a class on Carla, but they let you use it through there. But now I'm trying to get it to run on my own machine and it's in a pain. But yeah, I have had some knowledge of Carla. And, and uh, the, uh, the, the remote machine that you have, one, one of the concerns I actually have is because you're using a VNC, um, uh, the, uh, the speed of which the images are being transferred to you or the access that you have to the machine is naturally limited to the access of that particular remote service. So I assume um, you will be only calculating a particular number of seconds of self-driving, right? Yeah, I, what I actually want to do is just, so I'm only using the, so really I just want to get Carla run, run on there and then you could save the, basically all the images and all the, you could save, I guess the whole simulation of you driving then I'm going to send it over to a different notebook where I actually train. Good. Okay. That then, would be good. Yes. Th uh, that that's really uh, I, I think important. Yeah. And the next thing that you um, that I don't yet have understood is is, is the feature detection or um, you know what you want to do is this is I think you said you want to drive in a straight line, right? Or I I say at least a straight line, but yeah you could be simplifying your thing. And I've, I've given the same tip to another student that has taken with me a class before. You've actually developed at that point in, uh, a, a little robot car and the robot car drove up to a stop sign or to a face, detected the face and recognized who was the person that was standing in front of the car. You could naturally drive up to a stop sign and simply say, oh, now you need to stop. I think that would be sufficient for your, for your project. Uh, you have to make an assessment if Carla provides you with already the algorithms to do the straight line detection, and then to identify what the novel feature is that you're trying to come up with, or you describe what that you replicate the use of Carla, right? So, so the question Isn't becomes- Isn't Carla just the source of data? The algorithm must be outside Carla. No, Carla is a, uh, so if you go back to, oh, I'm confused about what you, do you mean if, if Carla is a data set? 
Well, Kala creates the data, isn't that correct? Yeah, so it it's kind of like it provides like a sort of like a real simulated environment, so then you can get actual data without having to drive a car and hook up a bunch of sensors through it. But it does not provide you with the and now you and there is no algorithm in it that simply says this is drive straight, right? Um, there's a lot of resources out there that are used. I'm sure there's one for lane detection. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm, well, I'm, but that's probably outside Carla. I think that's all we're saying. Yeah, Carla. I don't think I think uh, Carla's just used to generate data, not really. But Carla's a data set generator. Yeah. Uh, 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 yeah, but see, for example, it may be simpler for you to detect the red traffic light instead of detecting the straight line. Well, he's. I think again, you should be careful to to scope the project properly because this is obviously there are billions of dollars being spent on this problem by by Waymo, Tesla, GM, etc. Cruise rather, that's GM. So I, I think you can't, uh, you should just see what you can do. So decide, find out by running Carla how much data you can get and of what type, and then choose a realistic algorithm, which certainly can use transfer learning if appropriate. Okay. Right. And it becomes similar to the plant detection. If you, well, for example. The same, uh, both of those are image problems which can use some aspect of transfer learning. And both are in, in, both are hugely ambitious. This is most of these projects are pretty, I would say, in fact, all of them are hugely ambitious. That's good. Um. Again, if you have any issues, just, just send us email. Okay. I think for now, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna keep, I guess I'll scale my project down if- yes, I, You just have to see what you can do and, and do enough work on what's available to be able to do a realistic project, that's all. Okay. Well, this has been amazing. I didn't expect to see such sophisticated um, projects, so. We've sort of reached the end of the class almost. So are there any last questions? Okay, well, keep up the good work. And all of you just tell, tell us if you have any issues that either we can help you with or by getting technical progress or um, we can um, help you decide how to scope your project appropriately. And, and please add your information from the PowerPoints to your um, reports. Yes. Don't, don't underestimate this. You can't write the report on the last day. Okay, so, so you need to do this every week. And of course the PowerPoint should be in your GitHub as well. All right, thank you so much, everybody. Please tell us if you need help. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.